Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution? Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corkin here. I'm the host of this show, and I feel so privileged every week to have great conversations with CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of all kinds of different companies, ranging from Netflix, YPO, EO, Activation, Blizzard, Lending Tree, Open Table, Axe Software. Go check out my archives. You'll see some great episodes there. I'm also the co-founder of Rise25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. And before I introduce today's guests, I want to give a quick shout out and a thank you to Matt Stock and Karen Ravago Ballaret at UC Santa Barbara, who's helping to put together this series, profiling some top UC Santa Barbara entrepreneurs and founders. And my guest, is, it's kind of funny, his introduction sounds a little bit like a knock-knock joke. He's a gaucho, he's a nuclear engineer, and he's a unicorn, or at least a unicorn founder. He's founded or co-founded several technology-driven startup companies that executed multi-billion dollar IPOs, including one which he rode, really contributed to, uh, under a million dollars to eight billion dollars, just truly phenomenal. We're going to talk about that in a second. Another one that was acquired for around six hundred fifty million. He has also served as a trustee for the UC Santa Barbara Foundation and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, and also has produced has, has served on a number of different advisory boards affiliated with UC Santa Barbara. And he's also a member of the Tech Coast Angels and Santa Barbara Angel Alliance and past chairman of the Central Coast Chapter of the MIT Enterprise Forum. And of course, this episode is brought to you by Rise25 Media, where we help B2B businesses to get clients referrals and strategic partnerships with done for you podcasts and content marketing. And if you are curious about doing a podcast, I'm an evangelist. I've told everyone for the last 11 years that they should do a podcast. So if you're curious, email us at support at Rise25 Media. Or you can check out our website, rise25.com. All right, Craig, such a pleasure to have you here today. And, um, you know, I want to ask you about this rocket ship ride that you went on over the course of about 25 years. Um, you joined this little startup company that was doing some consulting work, advising the Navy on government contracting, stuff like that, under a million dollars in revenue. It's called SAIC, publicly traded company now. Took it from however many, a couple dozen, maybe 100 employees, under a million in revenue to $8 billion, 40,000 employees, 200 or so offices. What, an crazy, what a crazy ride that must have been. But it starts with Bob Beister, I think was his name. Bob Beister was the, mm -hmm. the CEO, founder, an amazing. Talk, talk a little bit about Bob, because I know he has a big influence on your life. He, he certainly certainly was. He was like a really like a second father to me. Uh, he's the one that uh, founded SAIC, and the driving force for him was to have uh, an employee-owned company. Uh, he really felt almost religiously that those who who build the company, create the company, should own the company and not outsiders. And uh, that may not sound terribly unique today, but it was highly unique at the time, um, and in the early 70s, mid 70s, and uh, it turned out to be an incredible formula, really. Uh, and it, it probably made a lot of people a lot of money, a lot of members. We, of we mentioned a lot of a lot of millionaires. Yeah. Um, at the, I think you mentioned this, but at the end of the, uh, at the end of my time at the company, it was about uh, eight billion dollars in revenue. And uh, the largest shareholder was uh, at that time the CEO, Bob Beiser, and he owned less, well under two percent of the company, barely one percent, and the wow. rest of it was spread out. So it, it really was a, a truly an employee-owned company, uh, not mm -hmm. just a couple of people at the top. And incredibly intelligent people there. You were one of the few non-PhDs, even though. You're no slouch. You had a degree in nuclear engineering, a degree, a master's degree from MIT, but you said you felt a little bit intimidated at times. And 
he gave you some words of wisdom. Yes, uh, I was intimidated a lot of the time. Uh, when I first showed up, I really in my group or the, the my office that, that I was in, there was um, I was the only non PhD. And most of the, these guys had PhDs from, you know, really prestigious schools, not just some some podunk place. And most of it was in physics and uh, math, uh, engineering degrees. Uh, and again, I was the only non PhD there. And these guys were so brilliant. Uh, I showed up and I was also the youngest by about 10 to 15 years. And after a couple of meetings and projects, I said, man, I'm not going to survive here. These guys are so friggin' smart. They're going to discover that I'm not in that league and they'll get rid of me. <laughs> but it, 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 I got kind of down and, and Vicer came over uh, and more than once and said, Hey, don't worry about it. Just, just keep your head down, plugging away. Uh, you're, you're doing fine. And, and uh, you know, I stayed on for 25 plus years uh, after that. So that, that was an interesting start. <laughs> yeah. Now, one of the challenges of growing that dramatically is your role has to change over time. And, you know, you said that you were kind of known as senior VP of whatever is coming next. So it sounds like you evolved, you oversaw different divisions. What did it take in order to survive and thrive at a company that changed so dramatically from under a million in revenue to eight billion in revenue? How did you evolve and adapt and move into different roles? Well, a lot of people don't. Uh, we had a lot of employees that, that really... Uh, we're not made for that environment. It's a very fast paced environment. And you're absolutely right. Your job was changing you know, very rapidly, frequently. And uh, it's a personality sort of a thing. And for me, that was a, the perfect recipe. I have a short attention span. And uh, you know, once a project is sort of mastered or, or you know, we, we figured it out, uh, for me anyway, it gets boring after that. I you know, want to go on and do something else. And so, um, it was, it was absolutely the, the greatest job. If I had to write out a job description, I couldn't have done better than, or you know, had a better job than what I did have. It was uh, really, really fantastic. I, I'm kind of a geek, you know, at heart. So I worked on all kinds of technologies. I mean, really amazing stuff. And most of it, I didn't know anything about when I started, but it, it was really interesting. So I had no problem uh, reading up and, and learning and, and uh, and, and one of the things that was interesting about what you did is you were taking new technologies and adapting them to non-traditional, old school, non-sexy industries like railroads and toll collection places. Like talk about the toll collection example, because that's, that's one where you have, you know, or you did have low wage workers collecting coins. <laughs> so yeah. there's issues with, you know, theft and accuracy, all that kind of stuff. So talk a little bit about those experiences. Yeah, there was uh, in toll roads are, are much more common in the east uh, and uh, than they are here in in, in the west. So, um, for those of you who were born and raised in California or the Northwest, you probably haven't seen that many toll toll roads or toll bridges, but they're very prevalent in the east. And the traditional way these things were organized was, you know, you you seen the toll booth and you come in and you give the guy a quarter, sometimes two quarters. I don't know what whatever it is. Sometimes it's a dollar. Many times you wait for change. You have an automatic coin machine where sometimes you can throw it into the basket and hopefully correct it, uh, count it correctly. But uh, it was a situation where actually it's an awful lot of money. If you go through the math on it, it's a phenomenal amount of money. And it's in the hands of, of uh, minimum wage employees. And, and this is just not a, a very good situation. There was no real inherent accounting of it in, in the sense of, of zeroing out at the end of the day, let's say, or at the end of a shift. So it was, there was a lot, of, of, uh, a lot of the profit sharing going on with the toll collectors. <laughs> Um, and our system was totally electronic. Today, it, it would not be considered that, that unique, but we were the first ones to build a totally electronic system. Uh, and it also was a free flow system. In other words, you didn't have to stop at the tollway. If it was equipped properly, you just drive right on through. And, and nowadays, most of them don't even have a toll booth at all. You just, you drive right through. Like, right, right. After some of those. And so uh, it was tremendously successful. And um, it you know it was kind of hard for some people to get used to it, 
Uh, but um, yeah, anytime you, know, you have an old school industry where it requires a lot of change, was that a hard sell going to these bridge districts and counties and highway districts and trying to sell them on this new solution? No, not really. Um, I, I, I think it probably was, but I didn't see it as much. Um, I would always end up talking to their engineer and he would get it. And so it would be up to him to sell it within his, his group that say, Hey, this makes sense. And, and it really did. There was, there's no question. It was financially the right thing to do. Uh, it's good for the drivers because they didn't have to stop less congestion. You don't have to have a bunch of money with you all the time. You know, it's just like anything, any other account, your cell phone account or, or, or whatever you get it once a month and you look and yeah, that's me. And yeah, I probably took those trips and that's it. You know, so it, it was uh, not as hard as, as you might think. Uh, yeah. Now, another project you worked on, it's amazing to think of it these days, because these days we all have a smartphone in our pocket and there's Uber and things like that, which allows, you know, underutilized assets to communicate and coordinate different rides and transportation, that sort of thing. But you took on the uh, freight industry, the rail industry. And at the time, there are hundreds of thousands of uh, train cars around the U.S., many of which weren't really accounted for. Well, they had a rough time tracking, that's correct. And, and, and they never knew in real time anyway, where all of the cars, the rail cars were. And then some of them don't belong to the railroad, they belong to private industries. And, and so it, it is a really, a, it was a really a nightmare, a booking, bookkeeping nightmare. The good thing about um, rail cars though and tracking them was they stay on the tracks most of the time so you know you know where they're going to be and so it lent itself to uh, a radio frequency identification uh technology rfid uh, and and of course uh it is now the standard for the entire rail industry in north america and we installed probably 98 percent of the systems that are out there and they're being used today if you look at a rail car going by a big rail, freight rail car uh, train, you'll see uh, these gray tags. They're about oh, eight inches long. They're really heavy duty plastic because of the environment. Uh, eight inches long, maybe three inches wide. Uh, and they're, they're, they're bolted onto the side of a rail car. And that's one of these tags. And they go by a reader and we read it. And it's the identification of that car at that time, you know, any other information we want to add to it. So it allowed the, the industry to um, to really, really kind of walk into the next uh, generation. And, and it really improved their, their profitability. And one of the things that the railroads measure constantly is the rail versus truck competition. And there's usually the last 100 miles or 1,000 miles, whatever, it depends on the location, but it'll either be cheaper to go on the rail or on the truck that last bit and they measure it by if they're more efficient then they can take it further on average than the truck and that's always a a, a good measure and we really upped that number mm -hmm. you said something at the beginning though that was uh john that was actually really true uh we after we really got into the middle of the of the tracking the rail cars for for all of the railroads we realized we really should be tracking the freight as well because the railroad sometimes doesn't really either know or care what's what's on the rail car. And in particular, that applied to uh, what we call intermodal containers. These are those big boxes that you see. Most of the time, you see them on ships, maritime uh, transport ships. and But they're made to go directly from the ship to a rail car or to the bed of a uh, chassis of a truck and be delivered uh, further on down the path. So how do you track those? I mean, the logically we'd say, well, let's take those same tags and put them on, on the, on the uh, container. And the problem was number one, it was a little at that time, not now, but at that time it was too expensive to do that. And the other thing we learned is almost all of the, the containers, the intermodal containers are owned by third party leasing companies. And these guys just, you know, the box has like a seven year life at max and they just turn them over. It's a financial transaction. They weren't going to spend uh, 20 bucks or whatever it was to put on uh, something that tracks it. Um, so what, what they do have to have, though, is a 10 digit ID. It's four alpha and six numeric. And if you'll see that again, if you're on the freeway and you see one of those containers, you know, 
uh, we developed a, a system that could electronically read those, those numbers, even when they're beat up and dirty and covered with mud and middle of the night and all that. Uh, and that was phenomenally successful. So now we could track somebody's container all the way from when it leaves a factory, let's say all the way to the final destination on the other side of the earth. So that was a, that was really the, the final sort of piece of the puzzle, if you will, that, that really made it an end-to-end -end freight tracking solution. And did you, who ultimately paid for that additional tracking? Was it, it was whoever shipping whatever? Yeah, the, the, item shippers, the, the shippers were happy to do that, uh, uh, pay for that. It was, the incremental cost was, was very little. Uh, the cost of the cameras basically in, in, mm. in each uh, location, but that's a one-time cost and it, it, was, it was really minimal. It sounds like you were benefiting from uh, emerging technologies. Oh, completely. Uh, yeah. At that time, we had we we built a digital camera. There wasn't anything available uh, wow. today. Of course, there. Do you what, do you remember what year it was? Oh boy, the first one we built probably the eighties, nineteen eighties. Wow, wow. And, long uh, time before consumers started adopting them. Oh yeah, and yeah. and uh, the only one that came close to us was uh, in terms of of both the resolution and the speed was uh, Sony had a had a digital camera. Uh, hmm. that was almost as good as ours. We didn't continue to, to go down that path um, to make it better because it was getting the job done and uh, it would take some R&D dollars and we did not want to be in the camera business. We wanted to be in the freight traffic business. So, right. so that's how that all, all went. And of course now digital, uh, digital imaging is, is as commonplace as you sure. can. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And a lot more cameras, a lot more um, sensors out there for sure. Um, now, another amazing thing is that not only did SAIC go from, you know, the size that it was under a million to 8 billion in the time you were there, but also there was another company that split off from it. You want to talk a little bit about that, which now is another publicly traded company. And yeah. what, was the, what was the rationale behind splitting off that separate company? Sure. Uh, that's the split off company uh, is uh, Lados. It's, it's L E I D O S, and it's actually now it's bigger than SAIC, wow. which is interesting. Um, but uh, we had a uh, a problem brought by success, and that is we were working for just almost countless number of government agencies when we were big like that. And the agencies would often have us work basically as their staff, to help them prepare. Uh, solicitation documents and drawings and specifications. And then, uh, of course, we'd also want to do the job, but that would be a conflict of interest, right? If we're going to write the, the RFP and, and then submit a proposal in response, that's not fair. That's not right. So uh, we, we knew we could see where this big. is going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we knew we, I mean, we, we, there's no sense trying. That's as blatant yeah. as it gets, you know? So uh, we decided we split the company and, and uh, the former uh, SAIC would, would continue to work mostly on the government side, well, on the government side and in that capacity of uh, direct assistance to, to the agencies. Uh, Lados had a, a broader charter, including commercial and non-government. Activities. So it went that way. Got it. Got it. And, you know, eventually there was actually a board coup and uh, Bob was removed from uh, leading the company. What was that like for you? Personally, it was very um, sad. Um, I, I, I know this is business, um, but I couldn't even understand the business rationale. I mean, uh, the only thing that made sense was if you're just going to go on age, and I honestly don't remember exactly how old he was, but uh, it would have been in his late 70s, I think. And he, he is, for, I mean, I was, I, my office was next door to his, I, I mean, he did, had not lost a step at that point. And I don't think uh, that the, the reasons trumpeted for the, for the coup, so to speak, had any merit whatsoever. And, you know, that was that he was old and he didn't have a strong succession plan in place. And, um, but on the other hand, we're still breaking uh, revenue records every year. We're, we're increasing profit every year. I, so th those are the things that I think really should drive decisions like that, not uh, some phantom number. So, uh, but for me personally, it was very hard. He, he was a mentor to me. He was like a second father to me. Um, Enjoyed the guy immensely. Uh, we 
we did a lot of things together it had nothing to do with the company. Uh, he had a sailboat. We'd sail over to Catalina and other places often. So, uh, yeah, it was like, and, and you know, the hardest part was I could still see him all the time and everything, but it really hurt him. And watching somebody that you really care about being hurt like that, uh, that was tough. Very tough. So on the one hand, the fact that he decided to make an employee-owned company, I'm sure produced a lot of wealth for you. On the other hand, do you think if he hadn't made that decision, if he'd held more of an ownership stake, he would have had more cards in his hand and personally would have been more likely to survive that? Yeah, he, he's been asked that very question. Um, uh, he was asked that very question right after the, the whole transition. And uh, his answer was, was spot on. He said, look, if I'd have held more of the company to the point where I could really control everything, then we wouldn't have been able to hire the incredibly brilliant people we did because to hire them, I gave them a piece of the company, usually in the form of stock options. And if they hit their objectives, they got stock, which was extremely valuable. Uh, and he said, I never would have been able to hire the cal caliber of people that we did hire because um, I wouldn't have been able to give them that. And they wouldn't have come over if it was just for you know, a straightforward salary. So he looks at it like that, that it was re really um, an investment in growth to keep it spread out. But, but you're right. When At the end of the day, of course, uh, if you don't control everything, you can get it taken, taken away. So. Right, right. Now, um, today you are an investor, co-founder of Angel, Santa Barbara Angel Alliance. You're evaluating companies and founders and CEOs as they come in and are seeking capital in order to grow their company. Um, let's start with the, the funny thing is, we talked about this beforehand, if someone came today with the idea of SAIC saying that we're gonna grow this big fundamentally consulting company, um, if it even came to you as an investor, what would your reaction be? <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd say that's not a good use of my investment dollar. <laughs> I mean, um, I'm sure, you know, if it wasn't SAIC and I didn't have that reference or that experience, I would say, well, how are you going to grow this to any meaningful size? I mean, you, you're going to go out and you're going to bid on these consulting contracts that on average have a profit built into them of about eight to 10 percent. Um, you know, you, you, you just can't grow it exponentially. I don't know how you can you can do that. And, uh, you know, to this day, I, I think the only way that we were able to do that was just motivating people uh, incredibly, uh, the flattest organization of its size I've ever seen. I mean, there was maximum of three levels of management between the lowest ranking manager and the CEO. And it was just, you really had to perform, but if you did perform, you know, you, you, made, you made out well. Yeah. Talk to me about what what is an Angel Alliance for those who haven't heard it before, and why put one together? Yeah, there's a very there's a, a lot of different structures, but it's basically the coming together of uh, angel investors, that is individual investors, um, and tend to be focused on the startup part of the world, uh, and most of them have some degree of technology associated with, not all, but most, and so. One of the benefits of, of, of an alliance like that is, number one, you can put more money together and therefore have more of an influence with your investment. If you're going in by yourself and you're going to put you know, some amount of money in, or if you go in with a group and you can put 10 times that amount in, you're going to be able to control and drive the ship a little bit. So, so there's that advantage. There's also the diversification uh, aspect to it in that now you can probably invest in more companies and you, can, you have the opportunity to spread, spread the wealth, so to speak, your investment wealth, so to speak. Um, and then I think the third reason would be the diversification of talent. Uh, when you're evaluating a startup investment, wow, there's, a, there's an awful lot. If it's a technology-driven company, you have to figure out technology, make sure you understand it, hopefully as well as the startup company. Um, you have to be able to vet all the people, make sure that they make sense uh, and that, that um, they're the right personalities, let alone the right experience. Um, accounting, finance, all of those, those areas are incredibly important. Uh, do they, did they set up their stock program in a manner that will allow us to invest uh, 
responsibly. Sometimes they don't. Um, and so you, you, there's just a, a whole wide spectrum of things that need to be addressed. And as a group, uh, especially a diverse group, you can address them much better. Now. Yeah. Um, you said that when you're evaluating investments, 80% of your efforts go into evaluating the person, the founder, and the startup team, the passion that they have. Talk a little bit about how you evaluate um, founders and, and startup teams. Um, well, I think one thing that's very important is, is that, and this is especially true of technology people, they can fall in love with an idea. And a guy comes up or a gal comes up with this idea for a company and, and, oh, that's a cool idea. And you get real enthused and you fall in love with the idea and so on. Um, and it, it's never the idea that is a home run. It's, it's the people. And um, I, I've used this, this phrase too often, perhaps, but you can have a, 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 an A student uh, and a C idea and it's never going to happen. But uh, I'm sorry, it will work. I said it backwards. Yeah. No, a very the right person can take a crappy idea and actually make it successful. But yeah. the reverse or the inverse never happens. And so you, it, it's very important to put more of an effort on evaluating the team, the people, than the idea. Um, and how do you do that? I think was your original question. Is not easy or straightforward. It, uh, we tend to evaluate or meet with them several times with different people from our team, from the, um, the Alliance. And each of us will go at it from a different angle. Uh, there is uh, our, our founder, uh, our, our, our main, our leader is very interested in, uh, for instance, the founder's family. Uh, I mean, are, are you the first uh, uh, of the family to go to college, for instance? Uh, is, are you, could you come from a wealthy family? You know, not that any of these are good or bad, but in revealing uh, himself or herself, you do learn about whether you think they'll be the right fit to take this thing all the way. Uh, the other reason I think that a lot of people don't realize this is that when you do a startup, um, the chances are you're not going to hit it perfectly right out of the park on day one. You're going to make uh, a lot of pivots, at least a couple. Uh, and that's basically changes of, changes in strategic direction, either the technology or the market or whatever it might be. Um, and in a certain kind of person, you have to have a certain you have to have a certain ability as a person to be able to to make those changes. And very often they're they're jolting, you know, they're they're right turns when you're going 100 miles an hour. So uh, making sure that the kind of people that are that 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 you're investing in can handle that sort of environment is critical. Now, there's no easy way to do that, of course, but that's kind of the thing that's in the back of your mind uh, all the time is that will they be able to handle a, a rapid change in course, uh, you know, with COVID? I mean, what happens when all of a sudden your, your market died? Yeah. You, what can you do? Are you the kind that can, well, I'll figure this out and dive in and figure it out. Or are you the kind that just throws your hands up and say, well, I'm done. Yeah. So, uh, you know, figuring all that out is, is, yeah. is the idea. Tell us a story about um, any examples of some of the startups that have come through that you've invested in that you, you know, where you've evaluated the founders or you've seen them execute interesting pivots. Yeah, um, there's one uh, in particular that uh, stands out. Um, it's called Appeal, A-P-E-E-L. Yeah. And, oh, you know yeah. them. Uh, Jason uh, Spivak, who I interviewed, ah, talked right. a bit about them. Yeah. But yeah, t tell us about, for those who didn't hear that episode, tell us about this. They're doing some fascinating work. Oh, it's incredible. Um, I met uh, the the team. Uh, James through, Rogers, right? Is the yeah, founder. James Rogers, the CEO mm -hmm. and founder. Uh, a very, very strong guy. When I say strong, I mean in every way. He's uh, very brilliant. Um, I met him when he was finishing up his PhD at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and... Uh, just, just an incredibly smart guy. Uh, so he's also very strong mentally uh, and physically, and he he's just he's like the perfect the perfect CEO, the perfect founder. Um, myself and and probably five or six others in our group invested uh, on day one, literally the very first dollar 
of investment. Uh, he may have put some of his own money in <laughs> at the very beginning, but we were close behind. Um, and it was kind of almost an act of faith because we had no proof that this would work. There was absolutely no proof that his idea of uh, preserving fruits, vegetables, even flowers with an organic coating that's really made from the, the waste material of fruits, vegetables, flowers, or whatever it might be. The concoction is, is proprietary, but it's totally, uh, it, it, it's organic, it's safe, it's everything. So, so he had no prototype or anything like that at that point? Nothing. He had, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, he had, and his thesis was on something completely different, his, mm. his uh, PhD thesis. So uh, it was something he'd been working on. And so it was, it was in a way, well, at least for me, I won't speak for the other investors. It was an act of faith. I mean, this guy was smart. He was good. He, he really had everything it would take. And uh, we just sort of had to take it in faith that his, his uh, postulation, his, his hypothesis would work, that this concept of uh, an organic coating on, that could be sprayed onto the fruits and vegetables would, uh, would work and would preserve uh, those fruits and vegetables for much, much longer than, than normal shelf life. Yeah. Now, I don't know about James's background. I don't know if he had founded other companies before, but you know, someone like that who comes in who probably spent his head down getting his PhD, that's no small feat. Right. Uh, so they're probably spending their time in a book, you know, on campus studying for many years. How do you know they have the potential to execute as a founder of a business after having spent so much time in academia? Yeah, I, I think that's a very important point. And in, in James' case, this was his first uh, startup. But I think an indication is, is everything you said is exactly true about, about most almost every PhD I know anyway, as they're finishing up their studies. They haven't done anything other than read books and maybe do some experiments, right? That has nothing, no relationship to, right. to the right. real world of business, right? So, yeah. but in James' case, he was already working on this idea while he was finishing up his, his, his thesis, his PhD. And in fact, he graduated or finished it up much later than he could have if he wasn't pursuing a appeal in parallel. Mm. So here's somebody that's that driven, right, uh, from on the business side that they're willing to, in effect, delay the gratification of that of that sheepskin in order to get this business going. I mean, that's yeah. that's passion to the max. And that's exactly what we look for. Always. Yeah, that's great. Um, after you made an investment, how mm. do you figure out where you fit as an investor, especially if you don't take a board seat, but if you just want to deliver value, deliver some wisdom, some expertise, how do you know when to step in, when to help, how to be of most utility to the founders of the companies that you've invested in? Yeah, that, uh, appeal is probably not a good example for that because it just went to the moon right away. And uh, you can still claim, claim credit for it if you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I mean is, is that there was no opportunity for board seats for us. I mean, we're talking about people putting, you know, $100 million into the company or something like that. So oh. uh, we did have, I think Jason, Jason had a board seat, I think, uh, for I a think while. So, yeah. But, yeah. but the reality of it is when you get to the size that they are now and you're, and you're playing in that league, you know, we're, we're minor players compared to, to the big BCs of the world. So... Um, but what you, the, a more typical startup would be um, a case where we really want to influence the startup because we have all this experience. Presumably, they haven't done it very many times, if at all. And, and so we can help with an awful lot of things that, that crop up and want to help them do that. You can do that with the right people. Uh, other people, you can't. Um, they don't want you, uh, you know, looking over their shoulder or quote, helping and, and so on, uh, which is really sad because we want the same thing. We want them to be incredibly successful. It's our money in there. We're not going to give them advice that would be counter to our investment. So it's, it's really sad, but we do get that a, a fair amount. And it's, uh, it's one of those head scratchers. But um, a lot of the time, it's exactly the opposite. And it, and it works out very well. Mm. Now, <laughs> everything's not always rosy in business. And tell us about spectra fluidics. Well, um, I have to be kind of careful here uh, because I don't want to get sued. You know, okay. you know, if, I, if I tell you the truth, and it, obviously it's one with a bad ending, at least I think it's a bad ending, but it's, well, it's, it's a company that didn't last. 
it's a company that didn't last. But if you were honest and you say, the, you know, if I was to give you my honest opinion, uh, I, I probably would get sued. So, uh, but I can tell you uh, the technical reasons why it didn't work. Uh, the, the attraction was we, uh, some, some um, very bright people, uh, physicists primarily at, at UCSB had come up with an idea uh, that involved um, a technique for measuring extremely low levels of volatile compounds. And I mean, we're talking the parts per trillion level, which is something that just does, you, you know, normally you can't do it. Uh, and this was especially important for uh, things that, that are mostly crystalline and have a very low vapor pressure. So we could detect, for instance, almost single molecules of TNT or dynamite and almost single molecules of certain narcotics, cocaine, uh, for instance. And uh, in particular, explosives like plastique that are really dangerous and uh, don't have much of a vapor signature. So you, the idea was if we could really do it in the field the way we were doing it in the lab, in other words, being able to get to that parts per trillion level, it would be a very effective tool for locating IED, uh, improvised explosive devices in the field in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, for detecting uh, smuggled uh, explosives onto an airplane, for instance, things like that. And it, it would have been by far the best technology, but we were never able to get it uh, down to something smaller than a tabletop. Um, and even the tabletop was a bit ex of, of an extreme thing. Um, it just, we could never figure out how to harden it, how to make it smaller, how to make it uh, less temperature uh, dependent, uh, work in harsh environments, that sort of thing. So unfortunately, it, uh, it, it was not successful as a company. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's kind of the business, you know, you, you go for some of these and they work, uh, but some of them are, you know, really a long shot. Yeah. And, and they don't work. At least we they take don't swing, work. Take swings at the fences, right? You know? You got to. Yes, yeah, you do. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. It was 11 years ago now that you shut it down. And yet it feels like just listening to you like it was yesterday or it still, oh, feels, a yeah. little, still, still feels a little raw in yeah. spite of other the, successes uh, that you've had. Well, they say, uh, and this, well, I think this is completely true. You learn more from your failures than you ever do your successes. And I think it's because... A lot of us anyway, uh, will stew over that failure for a long time. And you'll say, yeah. I should have done this. I should have done that. And you'll go back and you'll rethink it a thousand times. And I guarantee you won't make the same mistake again, you know? So I, I think that there's a lot of truth to that. And instead of just walking away from a failure, or, you know, or something that didn't work out like you wanted, um, boy, there's, there's some really good lessons in there. But you have to be willing to look yourself in the mirror and say, yeah, I screwed up, you know? Yeah. And, now, um, you taught the entrepreneurship class at UCSB that uh, my other fellow guest, John Greathouse, taught as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, talk a little bit about what that experience was like and, and also why later in your career go into teaching. Um, well, the two of those were uh, related. I mean, uh, the, the entrepreneurship uh, and, and the teaching. They're, they're, to me, they're almost one and the same. Um, I get to take everything I've learned in starting up companies and entrepreneurship and innovation, especially in the, um, in, in the technical world, and apply it to a class and, uh, of students. And, and this, there's, the students take these classes um, as electives, and you know, they're not majoring in it. You don't major in, in uh, entrepreneurship. But, right. At least not so at UCSD, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you tend to have a self-selecting, passionate, uh, driven uh, student body. And that's fun. That's really fun. Nobody wants to teach somebody that is there because they have to be there or they hate the subject, but it's required. And that's no fun at all from a teaching standpoint. And um, it was just the opposite there. Uh, we had the only time we could ever get a meeting room in the beginning days um, what uh, we had always over, over, uh, subscribed, we were allowed 90 slots and they would fill up on day one uh, in the registration process. And then we had to find a room that would house, house 90 students and we could never get one except 7 AM. And <laughs> if anybody's ever been to Isla Vista, you know, 7 AM might as well be 4 AM. Right. Yeah. And yeah, there it was, it was filled every wow. time. And it was, it was something that uh, the students just craved, 
Uh, and they still do. They mm. still do. Wow. And entrepreneurship is hot. You know, it's been a, a kind of a hot field um, yeah. in recent years. Did you sense that? Is that oh, why think, yeah, there's absolutely. so much interest it, in the class? It's kind of sexy and everybody thinks they want to, you know, be an right. entrepreneur and right. make a gazillion dollar. Yeah, I think it's way oversold. I, I mean, it's not for everybody. Um, and, and that's that's n nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's right. just. That's just the way it is. You know, not everybody's cut out for every job or every position or every lifestyle. So it's, I think it's been way overhyped, you know, I mean, Shark Tank and all of the hoopla. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But, How did you disabuse people of the notion that it was going to be easy in that class? Well, they, they figured it out pretty early, um, you know, because we did a lot of uh, stand-up presentations, spontaneous uh elevator pitches you know i don't know if you heard of that phrase but you know mm -hmm. it's three minutes five minutes whatever an elevator takes to go from the ground floor up to 30th floor or something and a lot of people suddenly realize man this is what you're going to be doing most of the time yeah that's exactly what you're going to be doing yeah and across the table you're going to be peppered with hard questions you know i mean really tough questions are you going to break out in a sweat or maybe even worse, break down crying in the middle of it? You know, I mean, you know, you, you really have to be the right person. And they usually figure that out, you know, early yeah. enough in the class that they can drop it without penalty. So, yeah. 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 Um, I, we're running out of time. So I want to sure. wrap up. Um, I'm a big fan of gratitude. So if you look around at your peers and contemporaries, however you want to define that, perhaps some of the other investors that you've been investing with, who do you respect? Who do you admire that's doing good, interesting work these days? Well, uh, I mean, boy, by name? Sure, yeah, you can mention them by name, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll mention a couple by name. Um, my next door neighbor, who you mentioned earlier, John Greathouse, mm -hmm. is uh, just a fascinatingly interesting guy to me. Uh, and and maybe it's because he sings my song. Uh, he does everything, right? He, he, he really went to he got an mba at uh gosh where was it, it was really uh, prestigious school and he said that was the biggest waste of time in his life and i thought that was kind of funny you know i mean but he was being honest and uh he started up god i, I don't i can't even begin to tell you how many companies he started his own his own uh warden warden is where he went to. Uh, War warden school is where he went Wharton, that was yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, you can't do better than Wharton if, if it's an MBA you're after. And he, and he just sailed right through that. And uh, he loves to, uh, he's in Hawaii right now, by the way, surfing. And he loves uh, paddle boarding and bike riding. And I mean, uh, we, we've got a beautiful uh, area behind us that's wide open. And I know both of us like hiking back there. So he said, I like the fact he's so well rounded and he's a lot of fun. Um, Great sense of humor. So I was, I would say, uh, he is certainly a fun guy, and a good reason to get up in the morning if you're going to be working with people like that. Um, the other one is the is actually the leader, the founder, leading founder, if you will, of um, Santa Barbara Angel Alliance, and that's uh, John Patodi. And uh, he's an interesting guy. He never went to college, and he was born and raised in the, as he calls it, the wrong part of Pittsburgh and came out. I, I'm not really sure what drove him, but he, he came out to California and ended up settling in Isla Vista and turned his kitchen into a, a, a workshop and began building a company. And he, from nothing, built uh, CIO Solutions, which is a, a, basically a uh, what we used to call an MIS company or information technology company. And uh, it, it's been pretty successful. They acquired a new, uh, another company in, Vis, uh, pardon me, Vis, in San Luis Obispo and uh, they're doing, they're doing great. Um, and he, it was a lot of work on his part to put this angel alliance together. I know that. And it's a lot of work to keep it going. We, we um, review about four companies a month and he has to get them all lined up and make sure the logistics are down, which is incredibly hard uh, with with the, the COVID situation or has been. So, um, and he's very understated. Yeah. <laughs> I, he's very modest. I, 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 he's, I have no idea how much he's worth, but it's a, I know it's a big number <laughs> and he's just, he's just easygoing guy. Yeah, that's great. 
Um, Craig, it's such a pleasure talking with you. I know you don't have um, a business you're promoting or anything like that uh-huh. now, but um, if people who are interested in following up with you or connecting with mm-hmm. you, can they go to LinkedIn? Where can they go connect with you? Uh, LinkedIn is probably the easiest. If, okay. if that's, uh, I think most everybody that's yep. tuned in you is LinkedIn. So yep. yeah, LinkedIn, Craig R. Cummings, and uh, I'm the one in Santa Barbara. There's a few Craig Cummings. But- There's a couple. Craig R. Cummings. Yeah. Put the yeah. R in there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I got to put the R in there. That's the reason I do it because there's too many of them. Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, if, if, if anybody uh, wants to take any of the subject areas I, we've discussed here, I'd love to run with them. It's no, no problem at all. I love it. Great, Craig. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.